So there are over 300 or more cemeteries called Oak Hill in the Eastern United States alone. And Michigan has 10 different cemeteries at least that are called Oak Hill Cemetery. And today I'm in Grand Rapids at Oak Hill Cemetery and they are about ready to do a terror, tragedy, and true crime tour, which is a cemetery tour, so I'm looking forward to it. I hope you guys will come along and join me. It uh, has been here since 1857. It started as a small Jewish cemetery over in this corner. We'll see the first grave uh, on our way. Um, it was then the land around it was purchased by some investors, including a guy named Jonathan Giddings, who's buried here. And uh, Giddings developed this as a private cemetery. And just soon after, the city of Grand Rapids brought, bought the south side of Hall Street and turned that into a public cemetery. And then in 1885, they combined the two and made it all public. Um, so that used to be Valley City, this was Oak Hill, and now they're all Oak Hill since then. Um, You'll notice that some of the bigger mausoleums and things are here on this side, but there are quite a few on that side as well. Um, and there's about 25,000 people buried here today. They're still burying people here uh, compared to Arlington, which is like 600,000 people. That's not a lot, but it is a lot for Grand Rapids. Uh, when this cemetery was um, first developed, uh, I found an article from the 1890s that said, you know, I don't know what they're thinking developing this land south of Grand Rapids. Like, no one is going to want to be buried there. You might as well build it in Kalamazoo. It's so far from the city of Grand Rapids. Um, which is funny to think about now because <laughs> it's definitely in the city and, and it's, it's almost full. So it's definitely had its use over the years. Um, there's about 75, 80 acres total, um, 35 plus on this side and 40 acres on the south side. So it'll be about 7,000 steps, I think, is what I figured. <laughs> so it's, it's a good walk. <laughs> focuses on stories of tragedy, terror, and true crime. Uh, and so I start this tour with Elizabeth Wilson Welsh. Uh, Elizabeth was born in Scotland uh, in 18, let's see, 1855. Uh, in 1873, she married a sailor named Joseph Welsh, and they had seven children together, four sons, three daughters. Uh, but Joseph was a drinker, and he was quite abusive of Elizabeth. Uh, so when the youngest child was four years old, Elizabeth hopped a ship to America and settled here in Grand Rapids with the children. Uh, her husband Joseph followed her uh, within a few years and was living with the family again. Uh, about 10 years later, there's records of her filing a restraining order against Joseph asking him not to come back to the house, but it looks like soon after he was welcomed back into the home. On the evening of May 28 of 1897, Joseph Welsh came home drunk. Uh, their daughters were married at the time and had moved out, but their daughter Mary was staying at the house uh, with some of her friends because her husband was working out of town for months on end, and so she was staying with her parents. So as she prepared that evening to go out for an evening of Scottish dancing with some of her friends, uh, her father walked into the bedroom, uh, started yelling at her, saying married women should not behave like this, and uh, hit his daughter. Uh, his daughter and her friends ran downstairs uh, where they found uh, Mrs. Welsh, and uh, she sought to protect her daughter, uh, and her husband came at her and started threatening her, threatening her daughter, pulled out a gun, aimed it at her daughter, and Mrs. Welsh stood in front of it and took the bullet for her daughter. Uh, she fell to the floor, and uh, her daughter ran off uh, to get help and her husband stood over her body and said uh, woman are you dead yet and she defiantly said no and uh, he shot her again um, she didn't die immediately because she was able to recount this story she died on the operating table at the hospital afterward um, but that was elizabeth welsh's uh, rebellion and strength in spite of her husband and his abusiveness um, one of their sons, George, uh, we'll see buried over here. And you'll notice uh, on his grave, his occupation is engraved. He was the mayor of Grand Rapids from 1938 to 1949. So George is um, 
was a popular mayor, but he also was a hated mayor in many ways. Uh, there was actually a recall election that was going to recall him, and uh, he ended up resigning before that could happen. Uh, he was actually a staunch defender of a man named Eugene Nesbitt, who was the doctor at the Sunshine Sanatorium, a tuberculosis hospital here, and Dr. Nesbitt was very much a uh, Larry Nasser before there was a Larry Nasser, and largely abused uh, patients there. Um, and when he was being removed, uh, George Welsh defended him, and uh, when women would speak up in the meetings and say, hey, we need to investigate this man, uh, he would say, dear, why don't you go home and bake some bread? Oh. So he was sort of an ass, <laughs> in the line of his father. Um, but I, I do take um, heart from Elizabeth, Elizabeth's resilience in fight, in spite of her husband's um, abuse and protection of her daughter. tragedy, terror, and true crime. Uh, and here is a uh, tragic story of true crime. Uh, this is the resting place of the Landman family, um, headed by Marinus Landman. So Marinus Landman was a Dutch immigrant to the United States. He was born in the Netherlands in 1842. Uh, he came as a young man uh, and settled in Boston, where he married uh, another Dutch immigrant named Johanna. Uh, so they had four children, who are all buried here actually. John, uh, born in 1871. William, born in 1873. He might be back there. Mm -hmm. uh, Anna, born in 1874. And Adrian, born in 1879. Mm -hmm. So the Landmans moved to Grand Rapids when their children were young, and he opened a grocery store on Michigan uh, Street, on the corner of Michigan and Sinclair. So it would be where Butterworth Hospital is today, um, or near there, the McDonald's by Butterworth actually, uh, more accurately. So the family lived above the grocery store for a number of years, uh, but when the kids moved out, they bought a house on Ines Street a few blocks over. And according to census records, the neighborhood was largely German, Dutch, Polish, and Russian at the time. On the evening of September 24, 1910, at 9.30, Marinus Landman locked up his store and began the walk home. As he approached College Avenue, two men jumped out of the shadows, attacking 68-year-old Marinus, beating him with socks that had jagged rocks tied into the ends of them. The men dragged Landman's limp body down the embankment by the railroad bridge, leaving him on a heap of garbage. Rifling through his pockets, they found $27 and took off. His body was discovered early the next morning. Landman had survived, but he barely clung on to life. He had 18 scalp wounds, a mm. fractured skull, and signs of being strangled by more than one person. Mm. He never regained consciousness and died in the hospital two days later. A police dragnet honed in on an 18-year-old suspect named Arthur Shellhorn. Here's Arthur's mugshot. He had confessed to a factory worker what he had done. And he pointed the finger at his accomplice, 36, 36-year-old Clem Blood. That's not a perfect name for a killer, I don't know what it is. Clem Blood. So, uh, under questioning, uh, Arthur Shellhorn admitted everything that happened. He pointed the finger at Blood and warned them that he had a gun. So, to get Blood out of his rented room, they told him there was a job opportunity for him, which he went and then was arrested. When they went inside his room, they found bloody clothing, a knife, a 32 caliber revolver, and a pamphlet on short story writing, reminding us all never trust short story writers. <laughs> Blood confessed that he and Shellhorn had been planning the attack for several days and that they hid the money in the woods. The Grand Rapids Herald, which loved to exaggerate, uh, held no punches in describing Clem Blood. Here's what they wrote. 
He looks the part of a mercantile clerk rather than a murderer, but the steady eye, even voice, and cruel smile that plays constantly around the corners of his mouth brand him unmistakably a degenerate for whom the lust for crime is his ruling passion. Wow. <laughs> they describe Clem Blood running a crime school for boys like Shellhorn in the woods near Fuller and Coldbrook streets. Blood was a drifter who'd gone by several aliases. The Herald called him a master criminal, adept at highway robbery and cracking safes. And he served previously 10 years in Ionia prison for shooting a man in Kalamazoo. Not bound by the same laws of due process as today, like the gentleman I pointed out earlier. Uh, Landman was attacked on a Saturday night. The men were arrested um, early in the week. Wednesday, they went to trial, and Thursday, they were on a paddy wagon up to the UP, um, where they served life sentences. <laughs> Landman blood. left behind his family and his yes. grandchildren, many of whom are buried here. So this is the um, resting place of the Watson family. And if you've been on my other tours, you might have heard a little bit about them. Amasa Brown Watson was a lumber baron uh, who expanded his wealth by buying land in Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, uh, for very cheap that he was able to exploit uh, to build a lumber empire. He married Martha Brooks in Nuego in 1856. Uh, they never had children of their own, but after he served in the Civil War uh, and retired home, uh, her sister passed away, and soon after, her sister's husband. So they adopted their four children uh, by the last name Mead, and that's why you'll see the last name Mead on the side of this. Uh, Watson died of a heart attack on his way to the train station in 1888, and upon his passing, he left Martha with most of his fortune, $50,000 of which she used to build this. Uh, it took a number of years to build it. It actually wasn't completed till 1914, when uh, just a year after Martha died. So all those years, uh, Massa Brown's body was actually kept in the ice house on the south side of the cemetery uh, in storage while they built this. Uh, in the summer of 1893, 26-year-old uh, John Mead, one of the nephews of the Watsons, was living with Martha um, with, and his new bride, he was a newlywed, uh, at her large home in downtown Grand Rapids. He had just been to visit his brother in Chicago when he began feeling extremely ill. So John, who was young, he was in his 20s, um, went to bed and his wife called the family physician to his side. Not overly concerned, the doctor just prescribed some rest. But Mead's pain did not let up, so he turned to his at-home chemistry lab. <laughs> now, John Mead was an amateur chemist, and at the time, he had the financial resources to keep a small lab of drugs at home. Mead asked his wife to fetch him a bottle of chloral. He carefully poured himself a dose and drank it. But not long after drinking the dose, his breathing began to become dangerously slow. His wife, frantic, called three local doctors to her husband's bedside, but it was too late. John Mead died of a fatal dose of chloral, and there was nothing they could do to remedy it. It's not known whether he intentionally poured this dose for himself or if it was accidental. And that's the tragic story of John Mead and the Watson. So this is the resting place of Isaac and Daisy Johnson. Uh, Isaac was born in Indiana in 1881, and he married Daisy Sims uh, when he was 30 and she was 20. Like many Grand Rapidians who didn't have much fame or fortune, we don't know much about the Johnsons, but we know quite a bit about the man that Isaac Johnson worked for. Uh, he was named Albert Stickley. So I'll tell you a little bit about Albert Stickley, and then we'll circle back to Isaac Johnson. Albert Stickley was one of four brothers, Albert, Charles, Leopold, and John, born in New York, and came to Grand Rapids as a 28-year-old in 1891. Albert started Stickley Furniture. Uh, his younger brothers, though, didn't stick around very long. They actually fought quite a bit. Uh, but Albert stayed in Grand Rapids and ran the furniture company. He married Jane Warden, and together they had four children. Uh, but all of their wealth could not protect them from tragedy. Albert and Jane's first child, four, five-year-old Albert Jr., died uh, as a young boy. The next year, they had a baby boy they also named Albert Jr., who died. A year after that, the furniture, fire caught, furniture factory caught fire, trapping one of their employees inside, who died. They had two other children, Florence and Margaret, but Margaret died of pneumonia at the age of 20. 
and after 37 years of marriage, Albert's wife Jane died on Christmas Day at the age of 55. In spite of all the tragedy, Albert Stickley did not give up. He remarried, he retired from his business, and built a huge lodge for himself and his new bride in the UP. But before he could enjoy his retirement, Albert Stickley had a heart attack and died at the age of 65. Not long after that, his beloved lodge burned to the ground. <laughs> Upon his death, Albert Stickley left each of his sisters $25,000, but his brothers, he left nothing. Albert Stickley did not forget Isaac Johnson, though, who he left $5,000, the equivalent of $65,000 at the time. Mm -hmm. Isaac and Daisy used the money to pay off their home, and as you can see, they had the money to have headstones for themselves, which was uncommon for African Americans at the time, even African Americans with a lot of resources. The irony in this is that Isaac Johnson, the man who worked for 30 years for Albert Stickley, has these monuments here for him and his wife, while Albert Stickley has no monument. He's buried on the south side of the cemetery in an unmarked grave because his second wife and his daughter could not stop arguing about the family finances. Now, I don't believe in curses, but if I did, I would not buy a piece of stickly furniture. I don't know about you. <laughs> uh, Captain Wright Coffinberry was born in Ohio in 1807. That's his grave right there. Uh, and left his parents' farm at the age of 18 to be a carpenter, which he did for 13 years, but he was, would grow up to be a man of many trades. He enrolled in the Civil Corps of Engineers in Ohio in 1836. And in 1844, he came to Grand Rapids where he operated a watch repair shop. In 1850, when the city was organized, he was chosen as city surveyor. So he surveyed much of the city of Grand Rapids and its plots, in addition to plotting out this very cemetery. Uh, he, on the start of the Civil War, he was 55 years old, but he still enlisted and was an officer of the 1st Regiment of Michigan Engineers and Mechanics. He was the head of Company C served a year and a half. On January 9, 1881, he was named superintendent of the poor in Grand Rapids, an office he held until 1889 when he had to resign because of poor health. He died unexpectedly in 1899 when the railroad or the train car, he was riding a trolley in downtown Grand Rapids, uh, when it was rounding the curve um, from Camp Out to Lyon Streets when he fell off. And it's not known if he had a heart attack before he fell or after he fell, but he fell to the ground. Fortunately, was near the local police station. The police officers picked him up, carried him to a jail cell where they laid him in a bed. Uh, but Wright Coffinberry soon passed away. Uh, Captain Coffinberry was one of the oldest and best known residents of the city of Grand Rapids. And it was written about him, among all the pioneers of the city, there's scarcely one who's lost will be so keenly felt as this genial, honest, upright, and active old man. And I have a picture here of uh, Captain Coffinberry and his wife, who looked like ghosts before they were even dead, frankly. <laughs> and, uh, he was very old, yes, he was in his 90s. Uh, I actually spoke with a neighbor this morning who took this tour three weeks ago with um, her sister. And her sister said that when we were here, and I made a joke about Wright Coffinberry looking like a ghost, she actually saw Wright Coffinberry's ghost. So if you oh. believe in ghosts, <laughs> Wright Coffinberry could be here right now. Wow. She saw the ghost right, right here. Right yeah. here, yeah. yeah. That's what she said. Yes. Yes. So Ichabod Quimby owned a sawmill. Uh, and was a lumber baron in Grand Rapids' early days. He was born in 1824, and he was elected the first president of a local group of lumbermen called the Grand Rapids Boom Company, where together they would collect logs out of the river, sort them, and deliver them. In the early 1870s, he started a small community on the Thornapple River, which he named Quimby. He opened a sawmill there and employed between 30 and 40 men. In 1873, though, the mill, kiln, storehouse, and blacksmith, sh blacksmith shop caught fire and burned to the ground. Ichabod Quimby blamed it on the Indians, uh, which may have actually been true because he decided to build that town on Native American burial grounds in that community. According to his obituary, he suffered many financial reverses in his career. Uh, in 1879, they actually hired a man named Edwin Ewell, a lawyer, to be the benefit or assignee for the benefactors of his accounts, so that way people could get paid because he was so bad at managing his money. 
Uh, Ichabod Quimby, though, ended up having a very uh, ambitious family. His daughter, Clara, uh, owned her own lumber brokerage firm. Uh, and in, what year was that? In the year uh, eight, or she was born in 1856, but um, about 30, 40 years later, she was the only female representative at a uh, lumber trade in Liverpool, England. And when the people there saw that there was a woman there, the press wanted to interview her. Uh, when they did, they said, hey, you're the only female at this mahogany auction. Are you here for empowering women everywhere? Are you here to you know, prove something to somebody? And she said, frankly, I'm only here because I have to be here to provide for my family. I need to take care of myself and my own, and that's what I'm here to do. Uh, because her father left her with some debt, uh, and her husband left her with some debt, uh, Clara Quimby was a woman who created her own future, her own fortune. Uh, and that is the story of Ichabod and his daughter Clara. And next, we have this mausoleum over here. Um, but I don't know if it'd be better to stand here in the shade of the trees or... Yeah, yeah, I can keep the book closed. Okay. Uh, so this is the Hayden family mausoleum. Um, and this is one of the more interesting ones to look inside, actually. Uh, the stained glass window inside shows a veiled woman wearing a serpent headdress leaning against a dark shape that resembles a casket. And in her hand, she ho holds a lit inverted torch symbolizing death. Um, so Alice Hayden was one of two daughters of a lumber baron named James Brown, no relation to the singer. Uh, and when James Brown passed away, he left his daughter Margaret $100,000, but to his daughter Alice, he only left $10,000. Now Alice was wondering what was going on, so she decided to look into this. And she soon discovered that her sister had told their father that Alice was not in fact his daughter, but the daughter of their mother's physician, uh, a story that their father believed. Now Alice asserted that was completely not true and that her sister Margaret was doing this to gain the family fortune. So she took her sister to court and it was a highly publicized, highly visited court case by Grand Rapids' most wealthiest families. Margaret accused her sister of living the high life, of liking good things, and said that she did not deserve the money as she was not their father's legitimate daughter. Uh, the case went all the way to the Michigan State Supreme Court and Alice did win her share of the fortune. It was divided in half, which Alice used to build this. <laughs> and also the Brown Home for Aged Women, which is now the building that the William C. Abney Academy is on in Fulton Street. Uh, that was what she built um, using the funds that she had rightfully uh, obtained after her sister tried to slander her. But the stories from the Herald and the press at the time are quite funny because they tell stories of people sitting there gasping at testimony and applauding and standing <laughs> up. Um, and I would have hate to be the judge. Uh, Maria Mayberry was born in 1843. Uh, her husband, Frank, uh, was a little bit older than her. She was from New York, and when her parents died, when she was young, she went to Pennsylvania to live with her sister and her family. Um, that's where she met her husband. Uh, they married, and their first child, Frank, was born in 1867. Um, but tragedy really marked their family, um, which is largely reflected in this marker here. Um, Frank died at the age of 15 months. Uh, they had a daughter they named Mabel in 1870. They had a son, DeForest, in 1872. They had a little girl named Birdie in 1876, um, but she died of pneumonia uh, within a year of her birth. Their daughter, Margaret, was born in 1878, uh, and in 1879, 7-year-old DeForest died of scarlet fever. In 1884, they were expecting another child when both Maria and the baby died in the process of childbirth. So these stumps here around uh, on the ground here and also the ones off of the marker are in memory of the many children that they lost. Um, although two of their daughters did live to adulthood, uh, Mabel and I think Grace, Margaret, Margaret and Mabel. Um, and one of them, uh, Margaret, actually went on to train in Milwaukee at the School for the Deaf. She um, taught deaf students. Um, there used to be a School for the Deaf in Traverse City that she taught at for a number of years. 
that whole section along the side there uh, is where people are buried um, who did not have the money for that. So, so my ancestors, uh, the Buttes, came from the Netherlands in the late 1800s. They lived down on Sheldon Street. Uh, they didn't have much more than their fertility at that point. Uh, so they had 11 children. There was no birth control back then. Uh, and there also were not vaccines. So five of their 11 children died as children of things like TB, scarlet fever. Uh, and three of them are buried in the pauper cemetery there because they could not afford um, a proper burial for them. Uh, the city used to have records of where everyone was buried there, uh, but those were lost in a fire uh, in the 1960s. So they do not disturb that area right now because they don't know where everyone is buried there. So this is the final resting place of Ellen Smith, also known by Nellie. Uh, Ellen was born and raised on a farm in Plainfield Township and got a job working at a hotel downtown in Grand Rapids as a young woman. And it appears then is when she joined the oldest profession. Uh, city directories reveal that Nellie Smith owned and operated a brothel on Kent Street, Prostitute Row in Grand Rapids in the late 1800s for six years. Uh, D.A. Blodgett also owned a hotel on uh, the same street. Uh, she died July 13, 1887 at the age of 41. According to her death certificate, she died of syphilis. Um, her sisters in the Scarlet Sisterhood were her pallbearers and uh, the funeral was held at her brothel, uh, which the newspaper described as a gilded palace. Um, the newspaper said, the Magdalenes were sorrowful and solemn in the presence of death, and a large number of those in the Scarlet Sisterhood were there. Uh, a Unitarian pastor, Reverend Roberts, presided over the funeral, and he had these touching words to say about Nellie Smith. This woman who lies dead before us, if a little child would come crying to her door late on a stormy night, would take the child in and care for him, while those of us who have much and look down on those who have fallen would under such circumstances call for the patrol wagon. I am persuaded that those events which make a woman's life beautiful and lovely rise to the high watermark in this woman's life. So that is Nellie Smith. So this is the... This is the resting place of the Bain family. Um, and you'll see this plaque on the side for their son, James Alexander. Uh, James' mother died when he was a child. Uh, and James grew up to be one of 269 American men who were part of the French Lafayette Flying Corps, known as the Flyboys. According to his bio, he sailed racing craft and drove high-speed boats for years in Michigan and was described as a skillful pilot and a dare, daring man. Uh, he served on the front in the Escadrille Spad 85 and showed great promise, but on May 8, 1918, he was running a test flight of a 220 HP Spad when 2,000 feet up in the air, he went in for a dive, and at 1,000 feet, the wings of his plane fell off. His plane crashed directly into the ground and he was killed instantly. He was only 27 years old, and he was buried in France, but his family erected this plaque to remember him here. And here's a picture of Lieutenant James Alexander Bain. He had um, a nephew because his father remarried and had children with another woman. One of his um, brothers had children and one of his brother's sons had a son who was also named James Alexander Bain and fought in the military in World War II, Vietnam, 
Korea, I think all three. Uh, pretty incredible. But on October 15, 1880, 57-year-old Kristoff boarded the SS Alpina in Grand Haven, Michigan for the 100-mile overnight trip to Chicago. The Alpina never arrived in Chicago. That night, a terrible storm overtook the steamer ship, sinking it and killing all 60 people aboard. Debris from the ship was found on the beaches in Saugatuck and Holland in the many days that followed. There's actually a stretch of the beach north of Tunnel Park in Holland that still today is called Alpina Beach because so much of the debris from the Alpina was found there. The Custerer family was devastated by the loss and they actually put up a reward for anyone who could find Christoph Custerer's remains uh, and bring them to the family so they could have a proper burial. But unfortunately, they never found his remains. So this is the resting place of the Bissell family. Um, many of you know the Bissell name from the vacuum cleaner company, still in Walker, Michigan. Uh, the company was founded by Melville Bissell. Uh, he's the one who invented, or at least patented, uh, his carpet sweeper. Um, his wife actually is the one who made the company into an international corporation, Anna, because uh, Melville died soon after uh, patenting his carpet sweeper. So Anna's the one who protected his patents and built it into an international corporation, and she was the first woman to head an international corporation of that size. Um, so Anna and Melville had a son named Irving, who is buried here, uh, and Irving had a son named Wadsworth. Now, Wadsworth is a very pretentious name, uh, but Wadsworth himself was not a pretentious person. He actually married a civil rights activist named Hillary, and um, together they worked uh, as part of the Grand Rapids chapter of the NAACP. So they had a son named Silas, uh, and Silas Bissell is who we're gonna talk about here. Uh, Silas was an award-winning poet as an undergrad at the University of Michigan. He went on to study at Syracuse University for his master's, uh, and Philip Booth, a poet, was his professor and advisor. Now, he married Judith, and they moved to Detroit after he graduated, where he taught at Wayne State University. But in 1968, Silas Bissell and his wife Judith moved to Seattle, and that is where apparently Silas Bissell became radicalized in the anti-war cause by any means necessary. In 1970, Silas Bissell was arrested for trying to bomb an Air Force ROTC building at the University of Washington. He jumped bail, and in 1977, his wife Judith was arrested for plotting to bomb the office of a California state legislator. Bissell was a member of a group called the Weathermen, a terrorist organization. Silas and Judith separated, and Silas moved from city to city, running from the FBI. He was on their most wanted list for 17 years. He created a new life for himself in Eugene, Oregon, where he decided to become a nurse's aide. He earned a bachelor's in biology, a master's in physical therapy, all under the pseudonym Terrence Jackson. He was finally arrested because of a tip to the FBI in 1987. He served 17 months in jail, remarried a girl that he went to high school with in Grand Rapids, and did some community service before uh, following in his father Wadsworth's footsteps and becoming an artist. Um, Silas, his parents are all cremated, so they're not buried here, but this is still their family plot in the final resting place. Uh, Frances Rutherford was born in 1839 in New York. Her parents were immigrants from England. Uh, she went to the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania and spent a year at the New York Infirmary for Women and Children in the first class of female physicians to be trained in operative surgery. When she moved to Grand Rapids in 1870, she was the first medically trained doctor in the city. She was appointed as the city physician, uh, a role that was common back then. Um, and she was also the first woman to be named a city physician in the United States. In 1872, she was elected to the State Medical Society and later served as its vice president. Uh, but Dr. Rutherford's life had its share of scandal. Uh, in 1876, she was caring for a woman who died. The woman had two young girls who bonded with Dr. Rutherford, and their father, attorney Samuel Clay, grew fond of her as well. They soon married. But after seven years of marriage, Dr. Rutherford moved out of their home. And three years later, in 1888, Samuel Clay sued Dr. Rutherford's brother-in-law, Enos Putman, uh, for alienating him from his wife's affections, is what he said. 
Um, I don't know what happened in the case, but he was suing him for $50,000 for breaking up his marriage. Um, she lived the rest of her days, it looks like, with the Putman family, her sister and brother-in-law, um, and she is buried here on their plot. This is the uh, marker for the grave of Claire Hall. Claire was the oldest child of Sherwood Hall, who was born in England, and Annie Lowe Hall, who, or sorry, Sherwood was born in Alabama. Annie was born in England, uh, so I would have loved to heard the accents in that household. Uh, Claire was 17 the summer that the family vacationed in a house on Lake Michigan uh, in Holland with the Herrick family, some friends of theirs. Uh, that summer, while the girls were standing on the diving platform, Ina Herrick was swept off by a wave and pulled into the undertow. Claire jumped in to save her, but both girls perished. Claire's parents were devastated by this, and Claire's mother never recovered from it. She had four sons, but 14 years later, Anne, um, Annie Lowe Hall was on a cruise around the world on a steamer ship called the Cleveland. When the ship was on the leg of its voyage from Bombay to Yokohama, Annie Hall leapt over the side of the ship into the shark-infested waters. A young man from Washington, hey! D.C. jumped in to save her, but they were unable to revive her once they pulled her body out of the water. She, I have photos here Claire Hall and her mother, Annie. Uh, and over here we have the Kendall uh, Monument. This was designed by David Kendall himself. Uh, David Kendall's first wife, Dell, died in 1899. Uh, he remarried, but he gave sculptor Otto Vincilo a stone that he had carved this design onto. So while it looks like this is a natural boulder, this is actually a block of Bedford limestone from Indiana that was carved to look like a stone. And you'll see on it are markers for the various groups and organizations that David Kendall and his wife were part of, including the Sons of the American Revolution, the Ladies Literary Club, the Masons, Descendants of the Mayflower. Uh, so his second wife, Dell, is actually the one who left the money to start Kendall School of Art and Design. Uh, Kendall was a cabinet designer when he moved to Grand Rapids to work at the Kendall or at the Phoenix Furniture Company. Uh, he was probably the most widely copied uh, furniture designer in his time. He invented office chairs as we know them that recline and move. Uh, he was really uh, ahead of his time in that the arts and crafts furniture movement was based on a lot of his work. Uh, and he died on a trip to Mexico City in 1910. Uh, today, the American Academy of Furniture Designers, 90% uh, of their members are actually graduates of Kendall. So his legacy is pretty huge in the United States. Yeah. So this is the resting place of Sipke Sevensma. Uh, he actually moved to the United States from the Netherlands uh, to be the pastor at Eastern Avenue Church. Uh, and he was pastor there in 1888. Uh, when the church was involved in a bitter fight. And I'm gonna read a little bit of an article about it uh, from the Grand Rapids Herald. The East Street extension of the Street Railways Company dummy line caused another disgraceful midnight fight last night. So what was happening was there was gonna be a light rail built from the Civic Auditorium downtown that went out to Ramona Park at East Grand Rapids at Reeds Lake. And that was a park at the time that was like an amusement park. So they had roller coasters, they had a dance hall, they had all these fun things. Uh, but Christian Reform people didn't believe in fun things at that time. So uh, the light rail was going to go right by the church. And they believed that this was going to disrupt the neighborhood. It was going to make their kids want to behave poorly like this um, and get involved in things like card playing and dancing. So the church actually was outspoken in advocating for this rail line not to go through, and especially not to go through the church neighborhood. So this was actually recounting the second incident that happened when the church members actually violently revolted against the dummy line. A wild and desperate mob of citizens, mostly Hollanders, who've been opposing the extension in the courts and elsewhere for the past month, were called together by the ringing of the church bell at the church. It rang for over an hour while the Hollanders conducted an aggressive campaign on the part of belligerents against the deputy sheriff and the police. They showered them with clubs and stones and an officer was even struck in the chest. No arrests were made 
but one young Hollander was hurt in the skirmish. So um, this is the Ohm family plot. Uh, one cool November evening, uh, adult siblings Jenny, John, and Josephine Ohm were traveling home from Grand Rapids by horse and pug buggy. Sorry, I don't think I'm on. Uh, all three of the uh, adults still lived at home with their parents. Uh, and had jobs working in Grand Rapids. Josephine was working as a stenographer. As they neared their family farm, a man in a long dark coat and cap stepped out of the shadowy woods and demanded they put their hands up. But soon after issuing the demand, a shot rang out and Jenny Ohm was shot through her right hand and Josephine was shot through her right eye and into her brain. She died immediately. The case was initially assumed to be a robbery gone wrong. While police explored a number of leads and made several arrests, they had no serious leads for six weeks. Uh, rewards for information about the murder were posted by a local man for $500 and the Grand Rapids Herald for $200. Local papers were eager to sensationalize the stories and published various theories, uh, including that it was a young person who did it who had been influenced by uh, pamphlets by the media, uh, and then also that a Negro did it. Uh, but when they failed to find uh, a child or a black man to serve as scapegoat, in mid-December the police turned their focus to Joseph's, Josephine's family, specifically her brother-in-law, Adrian Samine. Adrian was the widower of Josephine's oldest sister, Anna, who is buried here. Anna died from illness and Adrian Samine had been with the family quite a bit since her death. Many thought it was a way for him to cope over the grief of his loss. But weeks after the murder, uh, under questioning, Jenny Um revealed that she had been secretly dating Adrian Samine, and in fact, they had become engaged. She had broken off the engagement just days before the shooting. Jenny told police that she was supposed to meet Adrian Samine that evening at a roller skating rink to talk but she had ditched him to go out with another boy. Police suspicion turned to Adrian at that point, but Adrian had an alibi. He was at home that night with his parents, brother, and sister-in-law, who all corroborated his story. This, the murder actually went unsolved and remains unsolved to this day. In 1938, when Mina Decker, another young woman, was murdered just as mysteriously, newspapers compared the two murders. Both women were stenographers, both church-going girls, both cases baffled police. Yet other than those similarities, they were never able to make a connection, and both murders remain unsolved to this day. Although if I had to put my money on it, I'd say Adrian Samine did it, and his alibi was a bunch of fun. Well, I like to save the best for last, so. <laughs> this is the Peck family plot, and you'll see um, the parents are buried here, John and Hannah, uh, and their daughter, Bessie, um, who died before this story takes place. So the Peck family was among Grand Rapids' wealthiest in the early 1900s. John Peck owned and operated the Peck family drugstore for decades before he branched out into banking, real estate, and lumber. He amassed a fortune of about $6 million. In the spring of 1914, a local dentist named Arthur Waite began courting their daughter, Clara. Clara and Arthur were married in the fall of 1915 and moved to New York where John Peck furnished them with an apartment at the Coliseum on Riverside and arranged for a job for Waite with his old friend, Dr. Jacob Cornell. Mr. Peck also promised Waite a dowry of $50,000, but he insisted on paying it in monthly installments of $300. Following their first Christmas together, the Pecks invited her mother to visit them in New York for an extended stay. But Hannah Peck fell ill soon after she arrived. She died on January 30, and the cause of death is listed as kidney disease. Her body was shipped to Grand Rapids and cremated. A month later, John Peck, the greeting wi widower, traveled to be with his daughter in New York. But not long after his arrival, John Peck also began to feel ill, vomiting, nausea, and stomach pain. John Peck died on March 12. Just hours later, Dr. Arthur Waite loaded his father-in-law's body onto a train bound for Grand Rapids, just as he had done with his mother-in-law six weeks earlier. 
Percy Peck, Clara's older brother, was at home waiting for word that the train had arrived with his father's body when he received a telegram. It read, suspicions aroused, demand autopsy. The cable had been sent from a K. Adams in New York. Now Peck didn't recognize the name, but he decided to heed the message. So when John Peck's body arrived and Waite insisted on an immediate cremation, Percy said, no, we're gonna wait and do an autopsy. As they waited for the results, a murderous plot was revealed. When Dr. Jacob Cornell heard that his friend John Peck had died on his visit to New York, he had asked Arthur Waite to see the body, but Arthur Waite abruptly denied him. Now Jacob Cornell mentioned this to his family, how offended he was that he couldn't see his friend's body. And his niece overheard the conversation and said, I had an, an encounter with Arthur Waite that struck me as odd as well. She recounted how on February 22, she was having lunch at the Plaza Hotel when she saw Arthur Waite there dining with a young woman. When she approached them, he nervously introduced the woman as a nurse. Um, but she began to connect the dots in her head, and so it was Dr. Cornell's niece who sent the telegram to Percy Peck. A week later, Arthur Waite was behind bars in Manhattan. When he was questioned, he admitted, I never loved Clara Peck. She didn't satisfy me, he said. He poisoned the Pecks for their money and was planning to kill Clara next. He admitted that he'd poisoned them with toxic combinations of germs including typhoid, diphtheria, anthrax, and others that he was able to lift from medical laboratories. He put doses in everything they ate, from their coffee to their soup, their oysters to their oatmeal. When John Peck did not die as easily as his wife, he finished him off with arsenic and chloroform, which he knew an autopsy would reveal. Arthur Waite was a con man who had forged his way through life. For months, he'd been sharing a room at the Plaza Hotel with a cabaret singer named Maggie Horton. At his trial, Arthur Waite pleaded insanity, saying that he was a moral imbecile and did not know any better. The plea failed, and on May 24, 1917, Arthur Waite was shot with two 2,000 volt uh, shocks of electricity at Sing Sing Prison. He was just 30 years old. Now, Clara Peck is not buried here. She went on to move to Glendale, California, and she married another local man named John Caulfield, and they are buried at Woodlawn Cemetery over off Kalamazoo at his family's plot. But that is the tragic story of Clara Peck's first marriage. And I have images of the Pecks if you'd like to see them. Um, there's John and Hannah and Clara. And then I also have an image of Arthur Waite and his girlfriend, Margaret Horton, cabaret singer. And that concludes our tour. Well, that's going to conclude today's tour of the Grand Rapids Oak Hill Cemetery. It was a fascinating uh, tour. The guide was really great. She took us through not only what she had in the agenda but also if she saw something she'd take a minute and explain a little bit about um the either the grave or the monument that we were standing next to so it kind of added a lot more color to the story and to the adventure um, i really enjoyed today's tour it did rain so i didn't get all of it recorded so you're going to have to make sure you come to one of these tours to see the complete tour but today is a sampling of some of the highlights I hope you enjoyed today's video. Please take a minute to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, leave me a comment, tell me what you thought, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.